Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Showcase Series presented by IoT for All, the number one publication and resource for the Internet of Things. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon. We'd love it if you could give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you have not done so already. All right, on today's episode, we have two fantastic guests from Utility, Michael Austin, the CTO, and Joel Bernstein, the uh, Vice President of Strategy and Partnerships. Um, so for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Utility, they are a company that has built a scalable wireless and batteryless behind the meter kind of fitness tracker uh, for, for the built world. And um, we're gonna talk a lot about that today. We're gonna talk about how Utility has addressed the shortcomings and barriers to adoption when it comes to IoT energy monitoring applications, what their hot drop um, solution is, why it's unique from other energy monitoring um, technologies, um, and what is the energy data that actually matters for different use cases and why it's so important. So very good conversation. I think we'll get a lot of value out of it. So please enjoy this episode of the Showcase Series with uh, our two fantastic guests from Utility. Welcome, Michael and Joel. Thanks for taking some time to chat with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And fantastic having you guys. Um, I wanted to kick us off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself to our audience, as well as if one of you could also give an overview of the company and what you all do at Utility. All right, I'll start. Um, I'm Michael Austin. I, uh, I started my career at Motorola for 15 years and was involved in some of the, the early cellular work. Um, I was responsible for energy, uh, the battery on the brick phone. Um, the Dynatac was that first phone. And then uh, moved into um, sourcing and supply chain and became the senior director of uh, all the batteries for all of the, the future cell phones. So a lot of background in RF and um, and power consumption, specifically battery operated devices, I would call a cell phone the first linked devices, first IoT devices. Um, and of course, they've now become uh, very uh, relevant in, in our discussions. Fantastic. And joined a, a Chinese company for 14 years, BYD, the, one of the largest contract manufacturers in, in the world. Um, they launched electric vehicles. We opened up uh, an electric uh, manufacturing, electric vehicle manufacturing site in Lancaster, California, uh, with some 1,800 employees building electric buses. And um, I got to promote electric vehicles for a number of years with BYD. Awesome. And then um, jumped from that uh, to Vutility. Uh, and I've been with Vutility almost two and a half years. Awesome. As the chief technology officer. Very cool. Joel? Yeah. Uh, Joel Bernson. Um, I have been with Utility closing in on a year and a half. Um, I actually spent the last 10 years or so of my career in different um, roles at startups and, and larger companies in the energy space. Um, the last several of those, both at Utility and, and my role previously, I was focused on commercializing different IoT applications around energy management. So um, had a previous role um, at a company called Constellation, uh, previously part of Exelon, and was really focused on, you know, sort of the smart home space, how you manage energy at a residential level. Um, the VC team that Constellation had actually um, pulled me into a lot of their discussions when they were looking at investment opportunities as far as, you know, what's the commercialization fit, right. you know, what's the potential for this from, from my perspective. And so I um, actually met the utility team a couple of years prior to joining um, through that, um, through the relationship with our VC team. And they actually approached me last spring and asked if I had an interest in talking with the utility team about a commercialization role here. So joined cool. utility last April. And, you know, really just focused on taking a technology that had gone from sort of, um, you know, technical demonstration proof of concept that was, you know, just emerging as a commercially viable solution. And yep. uh, what's the commercialization strategy around that? So, um, you know, we've really focused on, on growing through partners um, who can take our technology, take the data and address a wide range of use cases. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun. I think we, we've got some of the most unique tech in the market. And. Um, you know, probably the most fun role I've had in, in my career today, which is really exciting. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, and, and obviously you kind of hinted on here bits and pieces of what the company focuses from a higher level. But if one of you could just maybe dive in real quick and just give a quick overview of um, the focus of the company, the role you play in IoT, that kind of thing. So we uh, we are a sustainability company, in my opinion. Okay. We, we like to deliver relevant and timely data mm -hmm. that... Um, 
that can be used for decision making, actionable data that drives insights. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that um, the, you know, the US electrical grid is an engineering marvel. Uh, it has been, but uh, most people still ingest their billing data once every 30 days. And it's sure. usually too late to enact change once you've already consumed the electricity or you've... Uh, so in order to um, really change, I think the way that um, we approach sustainability projects or even approach like our consumption, whether it's consumption mm -hmm. of gas or or water or electricity, we need to have better visibility. Sure. And that's what Vutility's main drive was. How do we, how do we create solutions that uh, let people have the data they need? Mo not, not vast amounts of data like the IoT could deliver, but the right. relevant pieces of data that drive insights. Sure. And what are those insights? And, and who are our customers that really need those insights in order to make timely decisions? And, and so we, um, we investigated a lot of different um, third party meters, sub meters for electricity, for, uh, for gas and water, and um, found that they were very um, inadequate for timely decisions. Mm -hmm. And so one, we need better data, we need faster data. And um, we looked at IoT as a potential for delivering, uh, delivering some of that data faster and okay. developed some devices around more timely delivery of that data set. I'll just add to that. I mean, I think, you know, putting on my uh, consumer hat, you know, the importance of fitness trackers and, and the role that they've played in sort of a personal health um, revolution, you know, using technology to better understand your personal health right, and, right. and helping you reach your personal health goals. Uh, really, that's what the sustainability movement is, is about, you know, companies driving towards net zero goals, um, ESG reporting, you know, um, you know, minimizing their climate impact and improving sort of their stewardship of their resources. Right. Utility bills are not enough to get you there. Um, in many cases, they don't even have access to all the utility bills that they need to really understand what their footprint is. But to drive decisions and really understand how to improve the performance of the facilities and the, their, their operations at a global scale, they need to get behind the meter in every single one of those types of use cases to really understand what's working, what's not. Right, right. And efficient. So, you know, we basically built this, you know, really, really elegant fitness tracker solution for use cases across the built world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we, we've, I think, addressed a lot of the shortcomings of other solutions, as Michael alluded to, right. um, in order to make it be a scalable offering. Very cool. And um, so obviously this episode and, and series is focusing on showcasing um, different things in the space that um, can help solve certain problems that are something that people can adopt after, you know, by watching this and understand what it is, can reach out and kind of learn more with the, with the overall goal of kind of increasing the knowledge of what IoT technology can do. Uh, and we wanted to talk about Hot Drop, which is, which is um, something you all have built. Can you just at a high level kind of give an overview of what that is, what kind of solution that is? Sure, sure. So um, we, uh, we found that energy monitoring and energy products, uh, and monitoring uh, were probably the fastest way for a commercial industrial uh, group, whether it's a building, to lower their carbon footprint or or move to a more beneficial electrification. And so uh, the hot drop series was uh, our 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 uh, our offering to address a faster install. Uh, a non-intrusive install uh, and one that would deliver data from very hard to get places. Okay. So, so that was really what we wanted to do first. And we, we recognized that, that for every commercial industrial building, there's a meter mm -hmm. and there is a central electrical distribution panel. And um, I'll be honest, the electrical codes, uh, and electricians understand this too, it's almost impossible to get a wireless signal out of these electrical panels because it acts like a Faraday cage. It blocks a lot 
of, of the different signals, whether it's uh, Wi-Fi or Zigbee or Z-Wave or okay. all these protocols, it blocks the signal. Um, but it's also the most convenient place to do individual branch circuit monitoring. You know, if you want to monitor all the tenants of a building, it's the electrical distribution panel, the main panel where you're going to find all those tenants. So um, the industry had wired solutions, you know, that you could, you could have a current transformer to monitor each of these, but they were wired. And in order to safely install that, the wire had to go through a conduit and outside yeah. of the panel. And if you wanted to do it wireless, you had to have the antenna outside of the electrical distribution panel. So we wanted a safer, a safer, simpler install. And um, we found that with a device that we developed called the hot drop. And I'll show you the hot drop here. Um, I don't know how, maybe Joel, if you hold mm -hmm. this up. But sure. This is, this is the hot drop. Okay. It is, it's the size of essentially my thumb. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a it's a small device, um, and essentially that device would be uh, clipped over uh, a wire. And you know, if I take a wire that would be stuck yep. in the distribution panel, you know, these are it, it's clipped over yep. the wire, and it harvests the magnetic flux on that wire. Okay. There are no batteries, right? right? right, right. We recognize that if you get behind the dead face of the electrical panel, you never want to open that up again, right? Sure. Sure. One hundred. Dollar electrician, certified electrician that's going to be installing behind that that panel. So, even though it's the safest place to install a whole bunch of monitoring submeters, mm. um, it also is costly to get back in. So, no batteries, okay. and we harvest that flux, and it powers a microprocessor. It's an edge intelligence device collecting the most relevant data sets um, and sending them up as packets through the LoRaWAN network. We also have okay. Sigfox enabled devices okay. through Sigfox public networks. Um, both of those protocols though, chirp out such a small, tiny packet. It's only 12 bytes or 11 bytes mm -hmm. large, but it's such a small chirp and uh, at, at uh, 20 dB that it can penetrate the Faraday cage. Gotcha. And, and so because of that, we were able to design a device and launch it in time with the code changes. Now, there's an electrical uh, panel install process controlled by the electrical codes. NEC 3, uh, 312.8 is an electrical code that controls how you lay out your electrical panel. Okay. The code had not even anticipated that anyone could penetrate that Faraday cage. Um, but in 2020, end of 2020, they altered the code to allow monitoring devices mm. inside the electrical panel. Wow. So we, we were able to launch uh, with, in time with the code changes that anticipated these wireless signals penetrating that Faraday cage, getting outside of the electrical panel, and then being able to receive them at a gateway that right. you're, you're, and it could be a public network. Sure, a public sure. IoT network, or it could be even a private network stood up in the building. Um, we we've installed devices in both, okay, in both of those uh, categories. But it became a very non-intrusive install because all Joel does is he just clips it over the wire, right, the code, and scans the barcode to okay. attach all the way through with our install. Gotcha. So, so that was actually my next question is about the um, kind of the adoption process and, and, and what goes into it. It seems pretty streamlined and easy to do. What does it look like from a potential end customer for you? Is it a pretty fast process from them reaching out to you to being able to start seeing data come in for on their end? Or what does that process look like? What kind of infrastructure is needed? Or how does that work with legacy systems that are already in place? What, what are the important things that people need to really think about or understand prior to the adoption of a solution like this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've simplified the scoping aspects of projects significantly as well. Um, Michael didn't get a chance to touch on it, but all those traditional wired CTs that people are familiar with, um, there's usually seven or eight SKUs that you need to go through to All get from to like the 300 amp yeah, device this, here. This, this single device here is a 300 amp and it's also a 10 amp and a one amp. Okay. It's, it's one SKU for, for all of those, um, 
ranges. Um, you know, basically you're eliminating, you know, several different SKUs that people would have had to scope through. Um, gotcha. We do have larger ones as well. So depending on the use case, there's a pretty straightforward scoping there's solution. There's a large one that's wireless. Okay, yep. I see what you mean. Uh, okay. But, but you know, that scoping exercise, we've templatized that. We've made it really easy to work with. Um, cool. I would say, you know, we, we focused historically on, uh, you know, if you think about sort of an end-to-end -end solution as having three legs, we focused on the data collection aspects and we focused on getting it, the data to the cloud so it can be delivered via API to anywhere. Um, okay. The third leg of the stool, which I would refer to as like sort of visualizations, analytics, and those are driven largely by the, the use case. And there's a wide range of use cases that the sure. data is running for. We can address some of those end to end. Okay. But I would say our, our primary go to market is working through a partner who okay. has some existing capability um, where, you know, they, they can visualize and analyze data, but they don't get enough right. of the data. So we're, we're supplementing their solution and making it more robust. Okay. One of the questions I did have about data for our audience that may not fully have adopted a lot of these different technologies or, or understand kind of the implementation, implement, implications that they have for their building, business, you name it. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just kind of in layman terms explain what the energy data actually matters for and, and why it's so important and at the same time what are some of the the use cases i know you said there's lots of different use cases that are possible out there but like what are some of the leading ones that somebody listening to this can be like oh i get it i i have the same problem um this solves what i'm looking for so yeah. it's just kind of those two things would be great just before we wrap up i'd love to be able to cover that yeah. I'll, I'll let michael if you want to focus on the what data matters and sure. I'll, I'll touch on the use cases after that sure so so when you're thinking about an electrical panel and especially if you're a building owner, say a, right. a building owner or, or, or manufacturing, uh, the first thing that matters is where is your consumption going, right? Sure. Because you'll get the bill from the from the utility company. There's 3,400 utility companies in the United States. You'll get a bill and you'll see two parts of the bill. One will be your energy. How, much, how many kilowatt hours did you consume? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty straightforward, except that it's really the apparent energy because it includes losses that you may have from your electrical panel out to the end of the wire to the outlet, right? So while you get real work done with the amps and the amp hours that you're consuming at the machine, you're actually losing some of that power and the okay. utility making you pay for that. So what you're paying is apparent energy. Gotcha. Um, the kilowatt hours. Um, the second part of the bill is a little tricky because it's calculated in a whole bunch of different ways ways, but it's called your demand or your demand charges. Your, and those demand charges usually are because at some period of time during the month of that okay. bill, you consumed more power at a faster rate than the utility wanted you to. Mm -hmm. You may have a 500 kilowatt um, max threshold, but you right. exceed that threshold for more than 15 minutes. Okay. Now, anytime during the month, your HVACs went on and you had three compressors running at the same time. You don't, you know, you don't have visibility of even what machines cause that demand charge. And most of the time that's more than 80% of okay. your electric bill from demand. So the first thing you learn when you install a bunch of hot drops on your branch circuits is mm -hmm. which ones are the offenders? Like okay. which, one, which ones of these really right. are driving the demand charge? And right. there are some immediate actions you can take. If you have three compressors that are firing up every morning at 6 a.m., all you have to do is offset that load and you immediately divide it by three, right? You're, you're, you're offsetting the load. So you can avoid significant amount of that demand charge just by level loading and mm. trying to distribute your load, uh, you know, farther apart than 15 minutes, right? So you don't want them all right. piling on at 15 minutes. If right. you can't, so that's the first thing. The second thing is usually these commercial industrial buildings have three phases. So they have 480 volt three phase being their feed. Mm -hmm. If you don't balance the way you're wired to your machines, if you don't balance each phase, you're getting charged demand based on the highest okay. leg, the highest kilowatt. So that's gotcha. called phase misalignment. Now, again, gotcha. you have no idea that you're misaligned unless you've monitored all the current 
flowing through that phase, right? And right. when you do that, you immediately see, oh my gosh, I have an opportunity to balance my load across my phases. And you can see 10% of your bill immediately improved by just balancing those three phases, right? Mm -hmm. Those are two very simple things that your data tells you in one day yep. if you're monitoring at real time, right? Gotcha. And, and so customers see an immediate ROI and can immediately cut their electric bill just by doing phase alignment phase and and doing peak shaving it's, it's, it's kind of like peak but it really it's demand management mm -hmm. um by balancing their equipment demand now in both cases the the utility supplies the voltage and your voltage may go up and it may go down but marginally. every marginally yeah it's pretty steady. That's what the engineering mar marvel with the grid is. It's pretty steady. They have a lot of voltage correction at, at, at uh, the mid-level step-down transformers, but mm. all of the equipment in your building experience the same voltage up or the same voltage down. So really, you have no control over voltage. So you can monitor voltage, but inside a building, if you're doing projects in a building, you don't really need that. That's not relevant to right. your decision making, right? The amps and the amps hours affect your electric bill more than your volts did, even though it's part of the equation. But it's the utility controls that. The second part is the way your building is wired. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, I just encourage you to rewire building. But power factor, yeah, how your power factor or your losses, mm -hmm. how that's being managed is a function of again something that normally the building doesn't change. The, right. the amps. And the amp hour the most so this little teeny device is edge intelligent and what we're monitoring is an amp hour accumulation so we're constantly sending packets on amp hour accumulation so if you lose a packet on transmit or if it somehow your gateway or the internet or the cloud you lose a packet it doesn't matter it's cured on the next transmit because it's accumulation uh, yeah. amp okay. hour. so it's secure and that's one of the big issues with iot data is People say, oh, it's not secure. I don't have a right. level of security, right? Well, that accumulator is absolutely, it's, it self-cures. The other thing is amps. We're sending amps over the transmission period, the min amps and the maximum. So you get what those spikes could be that you're getting. And we're sampling 3,300 times a second. So the living data set is very, very accurate. And we're giving the building owner essentially the relevant mm -hmm. data piece that they can change. Gotcha. Okay. And that's why it's so simple is, you know, we made on a very simple. Those, and off of that um, sample rate and the mins and the maxes, I mean, we do an edge calculation for an average. So you're really getting sure. really great granularity yeah. for, for what's happening instantaneously in the building. Yeah. Fantastic. And one, one of the great things about having an edge intelligent, and the, I'll show you the part that's edge intelligence, this little, there's this little core. And this okay. is an FCC approved limited module approval. We can sell the core independently or use it in other devices like we did on this, this CT, right? This uh, large bus bar yep. CT. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's FCC approved for both. But what's cool about this is that we can do uh, a, an adaptive correction at the device level. And that's why when Joel started off saying, hey, you know, this is a 300 amp device, it can adapt to do what this big device in the industry, I'm trying to get the same vision, that it can do exactly what that device does. Oh, it can also do exactly what that device does. And it can do it. So it can adapt because of the self-correction across multiple SKUs, up to eight SKUs we eliminated with one device. Gotcha. Okay. So Fantastic. It's it's yeah, it's pretty neat. Differentiators, yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, I mean, yeah. On the use cases side, I mean, what we see a lot of, there's, there's, I would say, some traditional IoT mm -hmm. um, applications. Those would include things like on-off statuses. So, okay. um, you know, we, we see this, whether it's hospitals, whether it's restaurants, um, convenience stores even, you know, it's like they have a lot of value that's in refrigerated spaces. Right. And if they are monitoring that from a temperature perspective, that's that's great. If the temperature starts to dip or you know go up, then they know they have an issue. Before that temperature is ever going to go up, the energy consumption is going to be going up. So the machine's going to work harder before it stops working altogether. And okay. we can pick up that difference um, with our device, and you know not only monitor whether it's on or off, but start to monitor 
from a um, maintenance perspective and from a performance perspective, is it working the way it's supposed to? And that that use case from a critical asset monitoring that applies to factories where there's mm -hmm. production or equipment. It applies to um, municipal water companies where they have giant pumps, you know, moving right. water all right. over the city. You know, it's like there there's a wide, wide, wide range of use cases. It's the same data at the end of the day. Okay. Um, back equipment and commercial buildings. You right, know, all right, right. Over, that's just an IoT application. Yep. Seeing more and more on the sustainability side, though, as well. So, you know, as companies are setting these goals and thresholds for what their renewables are going to be relative to their overall consumption, they don't want to try to offset their entire footprint. Ultimate goal is to reduce what the footprint was in the start and have a more efficient operation. Mm -hmm. um, and so using our data, going behind the meter is giving them those insights, what's efficient, what's inefficient. Yep. Yep. Um, it's also opening up the opportunity. There's a concept called shadow metering that we're seeing more and more of a need in the market for, um, where the utility bills may go to a tenant but the facility owner needs to be able to report what the energy usage and there's no mechanism in place today to get that utility bill data to the owner of the building if they're not also the occupant. So solving that by introducing a really cost effective way to get data out, um, allowing them to report what their entire operation looks like. But there's a lot of use cases like that we're seeing as well. So um, Very cool. Really versatile. I think, you know, yep. that, that's the exciting things to me. I'm not sort of pigeonholed into one. No, uh, absolutely. I think it's, uh, you, you guys, you've, yeah, you've done a very good job of kind of explaining not just the technical details, the simplicity of it, but also the value that this, uh, the product provides for the, the organizations who would find it most useful and be interested in adopting. So um, I think you've shed a very good amount of light on how powerful and impactful this can be, uh, especially in comparison to how things are done now um, and kind of the complications there. So for our audience who may want to learn more, follow up, um, kind of dive in with uh, potential questions after this, what's the best way that they can do that? Um, we have a number of contact forms on our, our okay. website, um, so that's an easy way. You can always reach out to sales at Utility. Um, feel free to look me or Michael up on LinkedIn. You know, Fantastic. We're pretty active there as well, but I'd love to connect with anyone who has questions. Awesome. Well, Joel, Michael, thank you guys so much for taking the time. Um, great conversation. Great product. Really uh, excited to kind of get this uh, episode out to our audience to show them more kind of the power of what IoT can do uh, for, for end users. So thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you, Ryan. Ryan. Appreciate it. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the IoT Solution video series from us at IoT For All. Uh, if you did, we'd really appreciate it if you would like this video and subscribe to the channel if you have not already done so. If you have a potential solution or something in the space that you would love to showcase to our audience, please email me directly at ryan at iotforall.com. I'd be happy to discuss what it is that you have going on and find ways to get that out to our audience. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next time.